Right, what we got today is hopefully a solution to my video editing conundrum. I use DaVinci Resolve and there are hundreds of shortcut keys and I can't possibly memorize them all. They can be reprogrammed to be whatever you want, but I don't really like reprogramming defaults like that. I prefer to keep my installation kind of vanilla in terms of configuration. So I could get a Stream Deck. I had a look at lots of different solutions for this. I had a look at Stream Decks, various different programmable keypads, macro pads, and so on. And in the end, I just decided to get something quite simple. So let's get all the noisy packaging out of the way first. This 25 key macro pad from AliExpress. These are cherry type buttons, brown. I think they might be Gator on, but I'm not sure. They might be some other cheaper version of cherry switches. It's a little programmable keyboard. It's kind of, it's fairly basic the way it's made. It's just a PCB enclosed inside three layers of acrylic that does the job. And then I've got some re-legendable keycaps. And so the idea with these is you put a little paper legend under there, clip that top bit on, might be a mistake doing that, and then those just fit into place. So I can have 25 custom keys. It's programmable by two different methods. Yeah, it's good. So I'm going to have my most used keyboard shortcuts for cutting video, for ripple cut, those sorts of things on DaVinci Resolve programmed into this keyboard, which I will keep on my left hand while I can mouse and use the main keyboard as well on the right hand. So that's the plan. Anyway, construction's really nice actually. The screws stick out a little bit, but I am going to put some little rubber feet on there anyway. USB-C, 25 keys. What else is there to say? I think there is a version of this that has LEDs. I don't think they're populated on mine, but that's fine. I don't really like I don't really feel a need for having LED illumination apart from to tell me status and things like that. So I've got to print up my legends, I've got to apply the keycaps and then program the keyboard. Should be fairly simple. Of course I forgot to look inside that bag, there's a nice, very nice flexible USB-A to USB-C cable. Really nice and soft and pliable that one actually, I'll have to see if I can get some more of those. It's lovely the way that's compared to a, other braided cables I've seen. Example here, which is quite stiff. This is nice and floppy. That's good. Some little rubber feet, which is what something I was wishing for, and a keycap puller. I think that's for keycaps. Maybe it's for keys. Maybe that's for actually pulling the key switches. I had to buy these items separately. Relegendable keycaps are really quite difficult to find sometimes. So I bought those on AliExpress from a different seller. We're going to get them all fixed up and sorted. So back in a moment. OK, well, programming this thing was quite interesting. The software to do it is a little bit buggy. So just a really quick overview of how the VIA software, or is it VIA, works, which is the one I used. You'll be supplied a JSON file from the vendor, or at least I was. You fire up the VIA, or I think I'm going to call it VIA application. You load in that JSON file, and that defines the keyboard grid. And then you can go and assign different actions to the keys in the grid. So they can be simple key presses, and you can assign them by finding the relevant place on the virtual keyboard they've got within the app. Or you can specify key codes. There's a bit of a weirdness with the key codes because it does seem like the VIA application only supports some of the aliases for the QMK key codes, but you've just got to try them and see which one works. You can assign modified key presses. So for example, if I want Control, Shift, and something else, you can do that as well. And there is a function to assign macros, so you can do a whole macro attached to a key if you want to. I didn't need to use that at all, so I didn't really explore that very much. Unlike QMK Configurator, all of the changes you make in the VIA application are applied to the keyboard in real time. So you can test it as you go, which I think is a bit of a benefit, really. The only problem I have with this is there's very little documentation for the VIA app at all. There is documentation on how to compile the app and how to load the firmware. In terms of actually using this application, you're kind of left to figure it out. Fortunately, it is quite intuitive, but there is a little bit of a learning curve at the start. And that's as deep as I went on that, because that's all I needed to do to get the functionality I was looking for from this keyboard. And so now I've just got a bunch of legends that I've printed out. I'm going to slap them on. Got it programmed to do the 25 things I think I use most in DaVinci that aren't already easy shortcuts like the cursor keys. So it's just a question of 
now sticking all the legends on, which is a bit of a pain, but I've only got to do it once. And the good thing is, if I'd messed this up, you know, if I decide actually after using it for a while that, that it was a silly idea to put function X on whatever key, I can just change it. Legends appear to need to be 13 millimeters square. And then they just fit in the bottom of the transparent key cap like that and click on. And that's good enough for me. You know, not as pretty as a double shot keyboard or a die sublimated keycaps or whatever, but I'm not going to spend a bunch of money on getting custom keycaps printed, especially when I may change my mind about what I want on here. So I'm just going to finish putting these keycaps on and then I'll do a little demo of how it works. OK, there we go. That's the last one done. So I've done a little bit of colour coding on here. The blue ones apply to clips, the green ones apply to tracks, and the yellow ones apply to the entire timeline. I don't know if you can really see the colours very well on that camera. There are colour codes on there. Might have to take my word for it. Right, let's take this for a little test drive and I'll show you what each one of these keys does. So let's say there's a better take of this clip here. I decide on watching it that the first take was better, but I want to find the first take in my media pool. So I just highlight that clip, press that button, that takes me to the clip that I've used in the timeline there, and there's my first take there, and I can say, oh yeah, that, well, let's put that in instead, and we'll drop that out and do some editing and so on. So that's what that button does. These next four here are obviously play and navigation. So these duplicate these buttons underneath the viewer here. So obviously we've got play and pause, which duplicates those two there. So play and pause, reverse play, jump back to start of clip, jump to end of clip, or jump to next edit and previous edit. Useful for just going along in little granules in the timeline. So that's the top row. And then we've got undo and redo, obviously. So let's say I delete that by mistake. Undo. Oh no, I did want to delete it. Redo. This one here, particularly useful, that's place on top. So sometimes when you add a clip into a timeline, it can be kind of difficult to get it in there without accidentally overwriting something. So let's say I want to put that clip in there. I want to put it at that position. I just put drop into timeline and it will find or create an empty track above and below what you've got already there. Copy, paste and paste insert, kind of self-explanatory. So let's say we want to run this clip twice. I'll copy it. I'll paste it, but that's paste that's done a paste overwrite. So instead I could do paste insert. Let's say I've got a gap in the timeline there where I've deleted something. That one just closes up gaps. Okay, so these buttons here to move clips around. This button here, if I press up, it moves the clip up. If I press down, it moves the clip down in the timeline. Particularly useful, let's say I've got this clip here, and let's say I had some complex titles and stuff here, and I decide I want to put something underneath them. Now what you can do, obviously, is highlight things and move them up. But I don't know if you saw that, I accidentally jogged that a bit when I went to move it there. And I've moved it along a bit. You can overcome that, obviously, by moving the cursor there and then moving up so it snaps to the cursor. But that's a pain in the neck. So what you can do instead is you've got this button here, you can just move things up, put something else in underneath that. Or sometimes when I've been doing a lot of edits and messing around with things, I end up with kind of messy gaps in the timeline, like this. Big gaps where there's clips up here and bits and fragments and so on here. So again, we can just use those to move the clips down so it's all nice and neat and tidy. In theory, these side-to-side -side buttons do the same, but I'm having a bit of trouble with those. This one swaps the clip with the clip on the left. It does something weird to the audio track there, so I've got to figure out what that is. That might turn out to be not such a useful function as I thought. Same thing here, if I want to swap this clip that way, I can do that. Something weird is happening to the audio here. It could be because that's not linked. I generally don't work with linked audio because the audio comes from somewhere else and I don't bother linking it to the clips. Most of this row here is about selecting things. So, quite often I find myself in a position where I say, okay, well, what I want to do 
I want to move the whole of this end of the video that way so that I can put something else in here. I just want to move a big chunk of video out the way. So what I can do there, I select everything after the cursor and then I can decide to move it like that. This button next to it does the same thing but only for the main track. And then likewise we've got, this, we've got select to start and select to start all tracks. So that's those selection buttons there. And then the bottom row is cut. So let's have a look at that. So let's say I want to cut there. Razor blade will just make me a cut there. Of course I can do that by going to the cut tool and then cutting here. I could do it in the cut screen or all sorts of other places, but I prefer to edit in the timeline here. And being able to do a, just a quick cut whilst I stay in select mode is very useful to me. So I can just move about here. Okay, I want to cut there. And I want to cut there. And then I want to get rid of that bit. Of course, there are other ways to do that because I've got these other cut buttons here. So let's say I just want to cut here and get rid of the start of that clip there. I can do that. So that's cut to the start of that clip. Same thing I want to do, cut and discard the end. And if I don't want that gap there afterwards, I've got the ripple cut here where it cuts and shifts along. And same thing with ripple cut end. If I want to just get rid of this bit and then shuffle these bits along, ripple cut end. So that's it at the moment. I do anticipate that after a bit of use of this, I will probably find that there's some buttons on here I don't use at all. And there are some buttons which I probably need to change or tweak or exchange for a different function. For example, this cut, this razor blade tool, there are different kinds of cut. There's kind of cut selected clip and then there's cut entire timeline at the cursor. I don't know which one I've got it mapped to at the moment. Let's have a look and see. It's, I've, I've just got that map to cut selection, which may or may not be what I want. So I do anticipate that over time, this will probably evolve a little bit and I will have to tweak it and so on. But the point of this is it's programmable. It's very easy to change these paper labels. Of course, it'd be easier to make those ongoing tweaks if I had a stream deck, but I would have a uh, hundred pounds less in my pocket and also they take up more space on the desk. So this is nice and compact. It's customizable if I need to, and it was nice and cheap. And that's the criteria I was aiming for here. If you're a user of DaVinci Resolve, would you choose these shortcuts or something else? What would you replace here? What would you use instead? What would you recommend that I do in terms of layout? Have I got the layout right here? I mean, obviously I think this works for me, but I'm interested to know what you might do differently. So there we go. That's my super cheap video editing shortcut pad. There will be links in the video description to all of the hardware I bought here and the tools I use to configure it. I hope that's been interesting. Thanks for watching and I hope to see you again soon.